Let's get started. Good evening, and welcome to the National Press Club. To all of those of you who have traveled from across the country, from around the world, or just down the street. My name is Mark Hamrick. I'm a broadcast journalist at the Associated Press. I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. I want to thank you for joining us here this evening to recognize some of the finest journalism in our trade. And that includes a recognition of courage, talent, and hard work, as well as a salute to a pioneering broadcast journalist this evening. This is a rare opportunity to spotlight and celebrate when our industry is so engaged. We gather here at a moment of tumult for our industry, for our nation, and our world. And it's precisely during these moments in history that we are reminded of our critically important mission, our responsibility, and our privilege. As we recognize outstanding journalism tonight, we reflect for a moment on the loss earlier this year of one of the great journalists of our time and all time, David Broder of the Washington Post. I ask that we now remember David for just a moment. Thank you. Some of us had the good fortune to witness in this room a joyous celebration of David's life back in April. David's immediate family and his Washington Post family honored his memory and his accomplishments with wonder wonderful speeches and tributes that day. Dignitaries like Vice President Biden, then Director of CIA, Leon Panetta, the former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld were here along with their security details. It was for me, and I know many other people, an unforgettable day. In its coverage, the Washington Post described the press club as a shrine to the First Amendment. And we are honored that David's son, Mike, and his wife, Robin, could join us here tonight as our guests. Can you please make them feel welcome with a round of applause and appreciation for David Broder? Thank you. David Broder was an important part of our community here at the Press Club. In many ways, he was the link between this great institution and one of the nation's, the world's greatest newspapers, the Washington Post. We look forward to the important work of reestablishing that link with the Washington Post. And later tonight, we'll recognize the work of three talented reporters from that organization who carry on that tradition of excellence. We're particularly pleased that Dan Balls of the Post will be recognized. Dan, whose work has been a gift to readers and admired by colleagues for years, was a close colleague of David's and spoke movingly and eloquently at that service in April. And tonight, we feel, in a sense, that David is here rooting for his friend, Dan. So it is with the great arc of journalism. Our rich tradition continues. Mentors show the way and are followed by worthy colleagues. These evenings of special recognition mark the prog progress of tradition. And when some ask the question, what has become of great journalism we have known, these evenings point to that strong continuity and a bright future. So as we recognize the top of our profession, we want to spotlight the promise of the future of journalism at this moment. Here to present the National Press Club's annual scholarships is Andrea Snyder of Bloomberg News, and she is the chair of the Press Club's scholarship committee. Andrea? Thank you, Mark, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, this year's uh, scholarship and fellowship winners. We have uh, two of the scholarship recipients here this evening, and a uh, third watching the live webcast uh, tonight because she was not able to join us. Um, I will first address uh, the winner of the $5,000 Dennis and Th Shirley Feldman Fellowship. Uh, her name is Abby McBride. She is a natural science blogger and illustrator for uh, New York City's Audubon newsletter. Uh, she is uh, one of eight students chosen for MIT's prestigious um, program in science writing. Um, she graduated summa cum laude with honors in, bi in biology and music from Williams College in 2006. And I am going to read a few excerpts from a letter that she wrote uh, for this evening. Um, I set my sights on the profession of science journalism after five years of geographical and occupational exploration, during which I gained experience in an array of fields, including ecological research, freelance art, and science communication. As a trained biologist, I place great importance on reporting accurate science, and I intend to rigorously research every topic that I cover as a journalist. 
However, a formidable gap lies between the realm of specialized environmental science and the general public. Um, Abby McBride uh, says that she is going to look to weave complex science into an accessible story in order to inform and engage reader, readers of all backgrounds, scientific or otherwise. She also wanted to extend thanks um, to the National Press Club for facilitating her studies through the Feldman Fellowship and uh, also to extend her heartfelt thanks to uh, the Feldman family, including Bernard Sunshine, Amy Chernitz, and Clifford Feldman for their family's uh, generosity and vision. And Abby says, thank you so much. <laughs> Next, I would like to present Catherine Dempsey, who is here. She is the winner of uh, this year's uh, Zimmerman Fellowship, um, named after the late Richard G. Zimmerman, who is a, a longtime press club member. It is a $5,000 uh, fellowship that she will be using to attend uh, Medill in the fall. And uh, Catherine uh, is actually from uh, the area. She attended uh, high school in Fairfax, Virginia. She, is managing she was managing editor of her school newspaper, a multi-season varsity athlete, and a straight-A student. Um, she impressed the judges with her strong, strong writing skills, her coverage of school financing, and her interviews with fellow students about their relatives in the Middle East uh, during the protest there. Catherine, would you care to say a few words? Well, thank you so much for selecting me as the recipient of the Zimmerman Scholarship. Um, when I first applied this spring, I knew it would be very competitive, and I fe feel extremely honored to be chosen for this award. And I'm so grateful to the scholarship committee for taking the time to examine all the applications and for deciding to recognize my efforts. And I'm so blessed to have your support. This fall, I'll attend the Middle School of Journalism at Northwestern University in Chicago. And I'm not sure yet what type of journalism I'll pursue, but I know that Middle's great, pro great program will help me develop my journalistic skills. And as the editor of my high school newspaper, I once covered the death of a student who died in a tragic ATV accident. And through that, I was able to honor his life and bring awareness to safe ATV use. And in the same way, as I continue with my career, um, my goal is to continue improving my community and my world through the press. So thank you for giving me the ability to do that. And thank you again. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Beatrice Dupuy, who is uh, the National Press Club's uh, Journalism Diversity Scholarship winner. That is um, an award of up to $10,000 over the course of four years with a uh, $500, one-time $500 book stipend in the memory of uh, the late uh, Ellen Mason Persina, who was also a club member. Um, Beatrice was editor-in-chief of her high school new newspaper in Cooper City, Florida. Um, and she, has, she went on to win uh, the National Scholastic Press Association's highest honor for online school journalism. Uh, she also won the Sun Sentinels. Um, uh, she took first place for news writing um, uh, in the Sun Sentinels High School Journalism uh, Awards uh, earlier this summer. And uh, Beatrice is going to be entering uh, the University of Florida this fall. Good evening. I wanted to take this moment to thank the National Press Club for this honor. Thank you for supporting my education and for giving me the confidence to continue pursuing journalism in, high in college. I've always known I wanted to be a journalist, but this type of support from the journalism community really means a lot to me. To me, diversity is very important and I try to include it in all of my stories, whether getting a diverse perspective on a story, using, a diverse pers using diversity of sources on the story, or just bringing issues of diversity to light. I've al I always use diversity in everything I do, and um, with this prestigious National Press Club Award, I am more determined than ever to bring issues of diversity to light. I will now dedicate myself to ensuring that diversity is not forgotten in the mainstream media. And again, thank you for choosing me for this prestigious award. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize uh, two previous uh, National Press Club Scholarship winners who are here this evening. Uh, if you wouldn't mind standing up, Armando Montana and uh, Joe Calamia. <laughs> uh, 
And before I turn the podium back over to Mark, I would like to say thank you to Joanne Booz, especially, who is uh, the Scholarship Committee's uh, staff liaison and a great help. Um, also, <laughs> also uh, Sean Bullard, who is sitting here in the audience, and he is my liaison with uh, the Board of Governors, and he has also helped me a great deal. And thank you to the judges who volunteered uh, so much of uh, their time choosing, uh, reading the applications and choosing the scholarship winners. Many of them are here tonight. Thanks to all of you. These young people provide some hope that journalism will continue to thrive in these turbulent times for our industry. Now it's time to honor the winners of this year's National Press Club Awards. The judges evaluated 140 entries in 32 categories, and as the winners are announced, you're all invited to come up here, that's the winners, to make brief remarks. As the honorable mention designees, you are recognized, and we ask that you come up to the stage to accept your award. The first awards to be presented are for outstanding consumer journalism in print, broadcast, and online. These awards recognize excellence in reporting on consumer topics, especially work that prompted action by consumers, the community, government, or an individual. The winner of Consumer Journalism, the Print Award tonight, is Michael Behrens of the Seattle Times for his thorough analysis of Washington State's, yes, go ahead. His thorough analysis of Washington State's adult family home system that shows how a program designed to move seniors out of nursing homes and into community care instead subjects them to decrepit conditions and negligence. He weaves throughout his narrative stories of patients who died due to substandard treatment. And this effort integrates extensive multimedia, including an online database. Congratulations, Mike. I don't think I have any words of wisdom. Uh, let me say this is just a huge honor. I'd like to uh, dedicate this to every reporter who's going to wake up tomorrow with the next big idea. Uh, every editor who's going to say yes, and every publisher who's going to pay for it. I'm, I'm fortunate to work for a family-owned newspaper that, that pays for long-form journalism and investigative projects, and they've never told me no. Thank you. The Consumer Print Honorable Mention goes to the Wall Street Journal for its in-depth analysis of private issue, privacy issues affecting anyone who uses the Internet. The series prompted action by both the high-tech industry and Congress to better protect consumers. Accepting the award for the journal team is Michael Phillips, who won a separate Press Club Award for a different piece of work. Michael? How about a, hand, a round of applause for Michael? <laughs> the winner of Consumer Reporting Award for Periodicals is David Evans of Bloomberg News for his coverage of Profiting from Fallen Soldiers. The package had surprising findings about insurance companies' handling of payments to families of fallen soldiers that allowed those companies to make profits with that money. The practice prompted public policy debate and actions by numerous government agencies. Accepting the award for David, who couldn't make it, is my predecessor, Alan Burga, a colleague of David's and the former president of the National Press Club. And thank you so much, Mark. Um, David was not able to make it here this evening. He is working on a deadline um, on his latest project. I don't know exactly what that is, but I'm sure he'll be talking about it here next year. Um, thank you once again on behalf of Bloomberg News for this wonderful award. It's a great honor, um, being a bit biased on this, uh, to gain a recognition from the National Press Club. And thank you to the National Press Club for all of the work that you do. Thank you. The winner of the Consumer Broadcast Award is King TV of Seattle, which turned a tip about employees getting paid for driving to work at Washington State Ferries into a series that uncovered widespread fraud, waste, and abuse. Let's now take a look at the screen and a clip of that coverage. Many people would define special project as something out of the ordinary, a job with a beginning and an end, maybe lasting a few weeks or months, and you're on to the next. 
But we found the ferry system has a loose definition of special projects, some of them lasting 10, 12, even 15 years. And as long as a job is slated a special project, taxpayers are funding the perks that go along with them. Brian Tweetmeyer has been developing those deckhand training programs since 1999. For the last 12 years, he's been paid to travel to and from the same office five days a week. The King 5 investigators estimate that's added up to about $220,000 in travel time and mileage over the years. Congratulations to all in accepting the award is Susanna Frame of King TV. Well, my goodness, thank you so much for this amazing honor. It's been it's really been a beautiful year for me and for King TV, and I'm so appreciative for this, this sort of recognition. I wanted to, to say I'm sitting at a stellar table. Will Lester, the awards committee chair, thank you. I love a, a judge or awards committee chair that votes for me, so thank you. And Bill McCarran, the executive director of um, the National Press Club. And of course, President Hamrick, thank you so much. Um, I shouldn't be up here alone. You saw that picture. There's four of us. And unfortunately, because of other commitments and because we live in Seattle, uh, my producer, Kelly Cheadle, couldn't be here. But that woman is an amazing person who knows how to run an investigative unit. And she's like, I'm such an old hag. I mean, she's like 30. And such, you know, with such sage and, 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 and vision and wisdom, I don't know how that manifested, but she's dear to me, and thank you, Kelly. And then we have two photographers and editors, uh, Steve Douglas and Doug Burgess, and they couldn't be here, but I, I just love those guys, and we worked really hard together on this series. We did about 25 stories, and one thing I'd like to say about it is, um, to me, uh, this series is really a testimony to the power of and the importance of public records. During the course of the year, I think we put in probably 40 or 45 public records requests, and Washington State has a really great um, open records policy, and I'm, I'm sorry, law, but you know, it's the law is only as good as uh, the government, governmental agencies are willing to follow it. So God bless them, you know, they followed it, and each one kind of turned into another story and another story. So that's one thing, if I could impart something to the younger people out here is that, you know, just go for it with those public records because they belong to all of us and people deserve to know things like what we expose that we're going on. And in case they're listening on the podcast, I wanted to make sure to thank my news director, Mark Ginther, and our general manager, Pat Costello, because they're amazing. And like Mike Barron said from the Seattle Times, who across the street from us, kind of, about six blocks away. They've never really said no. They just say, go for it. And that's such an amazing gift to a journalist. And I'm humbled by this, and I love being here in D.C., so thank you very much. Oh, can I say one more thing? I'm here with my 11-year-old son, Nicholas Swedeen. Can you stand up, Nikki? Here he is. It's... That's pretty amazing to have one of your children here for such a great event. And this poor child is hideously, and I mean hideously, um, uh, what, what would you say, tortured in your suit. But you look like a stud. Okay. Thank you. Honorable mention for consumer reporting and broadcast went to KSTP of St. Paul, Minnesota for a multi-part series that uncovered widespread abuse of Minnesota's welfare system, where electronic benefit transfer cards were at ATMs, at casinos, tattoo parlors, and liquor stores, all violation of state law. And it prompted action to rein in that activity, and here's a part of that report. An EBT card is like a debit card loaded with taxpayer money. Nearly half a million Minnesotans use it to buy food only. 176,000 have a cash benefit on the card. That money, mostly from the state, 
has no restrictions, not even for body art. When people say, hey, it's their money, you know what? It's our money. He who pays the piper calls the tune. The taxpayers don't want this used for these things. Not only what you can buy is unrestricted, but where? We examined all 2 million Minnesota EBT transactions for the month of September. We found the cards were used 54,000 times in all of the other states, including in Hawaii, along with 26 times in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Congratulations to the winners of the Consumer Journalism Awards. The next awards category is the Washington Regional Reporting Award. So we all know regional reporters are vitally important for providing critical information from Washington to readers, viewers, and listeners back home. The job of the Washington-based regional reporter is to provide a clear understanding of news of the day to a city, state, or region, or nation. This year's winner is Thomas Burr of the Salt Lake Tribune. And that is, uh, he's the winner of the National Press, he is a member of the National Press Club, I should know that, and previous winner in press club competition. The judges said that he made major public policy issues, especially immigration, come alive through his industrious, on-the-ground reporting and engaging writing. He took a close look at the delegation representing his paper's state and has a good eye for offbeat stories of importance. Congratulations. So I get an hour, right? Is Absolutely. That cool? All right. Just a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you to the National Press Club. I really appreciate this. Uh, this is actually the second year I've won this. Unfortunately, I was not able to be here last year. I was on my honeymoon. Uh, I could either be here with you folks or with my beautiful bride. Uh, as I'm, you can see, I'm still married. I made the right choice. Uh, my first thank you goes to you, Jen, as well. Thank you for putting up with me, for your support, for your counsel. And my other better half, Matt Cannon, my colleague from the Salt Lake Tribune, who has also been there for me for so many times and everything we do, and I really appreciate that. Uh, a lot has been written about the dying breed of regional reporters, and sadly, we've seen a lot of friends laid off, but that does not and should not distract from the important work we regionals do in bringing the news home to our readers, like my parents, who, uh, as much as I respect the New York Times, they don't read the New York Times, they read the Salt Lake Tribune or their hometown paper, and I think it's very important sometimes that we remember that we need to bring those, the news home to them. Uh, so on behalf of other regional reporters, and, and, and also a big, big thank you to the Salt Lake Tribune for keeping two people here. Uh, thank you to the National Press Club for keeping to honor uh, the regionals and, uh, and at what we do here in Washington. As journalists, we sometimes evaluate our own profession professionally the profession of journalism. The Arthur Rouse Award for Press Criticism is named for a longtime National Press Club member, a former U.S. News and World Report journalist who provides funding for the prize. I understand Mr. Rouse is joining us tonight, so let's welcome him. Thank you, Mr. Rouse. The award in his name honors excellent work examining efforts of the news media. The winner this year for work published in the American Journalism Review is Paul Farhi, a Washington Post reporter. The judges praised his detailed look at the judges praised his detailed look at trade-offs and losses in journalism and slippery ethics slope mainstream publications, often finding themselves on as they chase readers and advertisers, the slippery slope they found themselves on. Farhi's look at the National Enquirer's impact on the so-called mainstream media's coverage of Tiger Woods, they said, was particularly well-researched and fascinating. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I have nothing prepared, but I'll make it up on the spot um, like a true journalist. Um, thank you to the National Press Club for this award. I do appreciate it. Thank you to my colleagues at the Washington Post for allowing me to write for the American Journalism Review on the side. Uh, thank you also to Rem Ryder, my editor at the American Journalism Review. I don't know if you know this about AJR. It basically is Rem Ryder's personal journal. He pulls this thing together every month. I don't know how, and uh, does a fantastic job doing it. Finally, uh, thank you to my wife, Lisa. Uh, there's a movie called The Paper 
you may remember with Michael Keaton and Glenn Close and Robert Duvall. It's a great movie. And there's a scene in there that uh, reminds me of everything that my wife has had to put up with over all these years. Uh, the scene is, is Michael Keaton, the editor, is on deadline. And he's uh, got this gigantic story brewing. And he's got to meet his in-laws. And he's torn between finishing the story, seeing it to the press, or getting to this meeting with his in-laws for the first time. And the pressure he is under as he has to make this decision is one that I think every journalist has gone through. And we often choose to meet the deadline, although I guess we always choose to meet the deadline. <laughs> but I want to say in tribute to my wife, she has allowed me to meet the deadline. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I should apologize to my own wife at this time. But I'm sorry. Hope you enjoy the wine anyway. <laughs> An honorable mention went to Stephen Hess and Sandy Northup for American Political Cartoons, The Evolution of a National Identity, 1754 to 2010. And the judges tell us the book was a well-researched yet accessible look at the role of political cartoons, warts and all. Accepting the award is Sandy Northrop. The Edwin M. Hood Awards for Diplomatic Correspondence are named in honor of Edwin Hood, a distinguished Associated Press correspondent, the founding member of the National Press Club. The award recognizes excellence in reporting on diplomatic and foreign policy issues. The winner for print journalism for Impossible Dream, Rebuilding Afghanistan Amid Corruption, Nepotism and Mismanagement by Marissa Taylor, Jonathan S. Lande, Warren P. Strobel, and Dion Nissenbaum of McClatchy Newspapers. The judges praise the investigative series for its detailed reporting of faltering effort to rebuild Afghanistan that is severely jeopardizing our nation's foreign policy efforts in the region. Accepting the award tonight is Washington Bureau Chief Jim Asher. Thank you. Of course, this award couldn't have been possible without the courageous and difficult work that was done both in the United States and Afghanistan by the reporters who worked on this. Um, two of them who had to go through pretty extreme uh, conditions in Afghanistan, Diane Nissenbaum and Jonathan Lande, had stories that have regaled us in the Bureau since their return. Uh, it's not easy to, to make sense of a country that's in the kind of turmoil it's in. The good news about this award is that it represents for me and for us in McClatchy a recognition that our newspaper organization is committed to foreign journalism. We're going to do it. We're going to do it as long as there's breath in this body. So <clears throat> you don't have to worry about the future when you think about us. Thank you very much, and I thank the press conference. <laughs> The winner for broadcast journalism was titled AIDS Funding, The Price of Success by PBS NewsHour senior correspondent Ray Suarez and producer, director, project director Meryl Schwerin. The judges found this to be an exemplary piece of storytelling that left viewers with a clear view of what is a daunting dilemma as a cash-strapped U.S. government considers how to provide life-saving drugs to a growing HIV-infected population in Africa. Let's take a look now at a bit of this award-winning entry. Next tonight, another front in the war on AIDS. In the Mozambique has a long history of using theater to send public health messages. It's a program the American ambassador Leslie Rowe sees as key. The area that we are really trying to put a lot of resources into is prevention. Because quite frankly, there are not enough resources in the, in the world to be able to uh, deal with the problem of HIV and AIDS if people continue to be infected in large numbers. But Mozambique is desperately poor. Half the population lives on less than $2 a day. People without work, without enough to eat, often ignore prevention messages. 
Accepting the award now is Project Director Meryl Schwerin. This award is a terrific compliment to us at the News Hour, and since broadcast is a collaborative effort, the thank you comes from our great global health team, Race Wars correspondent who couldn't be here tonight, um, our producers Talia Miller and Kat Wise, um, and just I'm incredibly grateful for the um, editorial leadership at the News Hour that allows us to get to places like Mozambique, some 30 hours from D.C., and uh, and report on important stories. So thanks a lot. It's also very much uh, bearing mention the news hour will be front and center as we give our fourth estate lifetime achievement award to Jim Lehrer on October 28th here at the club during a black tie gala. We look forward to that special night as well. The next award is for newsletter journalism, which targets specific audiences but often has a broad impact nevertheless. The winner is Gary Evans for Hospital Infection Control and Prevention, published by AHC Media in Atlanta. In Atlanta, Gary uncovered data that showed how widespread deaths were from bacterial infections caused by MRSA in U.S. hospitals. Gary showed that thousands could be saved if the Centers for Disease Control required hospitals to follow the safety guidelines for this bacterial infection developed by VA hospitals, where unpublished data showed that about three-quarters of the annual MRSA infections could be prevented. Congratulations, Gary. Thank you. I'd like to thank the uh, judges for recognizing this problem. I've been covering healthcare epidemiology for uh, a good 20 years or so, and this is a field that uh, has really been shrouded by kind of a psychopathology of secrecy, but uh, out of concerns of liability and other things. But basically, uh, people go into the hospital, to, and 100,000 of them die of infections. Uh, of something they didn't come in with that's transmitted within the hospital. This one, MRSA, has actually been around a while, but I really want to thank the patients that and family members that talked to me about how uh, it has affected their lives and uh, the loss of their loved ones. I do urge everyone that has a family member going into a hospital to be an advocate for them because uh, the healthcare workers are just doing all they can. Uh, and uh, as I was said in the uh, uh, synopsis. The CDC, uh, the, the VA hospitals have shown that these uh, infections can be prevented, about three quarters of them, but it takes a lot of resources because they want to do surveillance of incoming patients. Uh, they call it surveillance, all right, it's testing. And uh, anyway, I thank you very much. Honorable mention is awarded to Laura Mahoney for article in BNA's daily tax report showing how elected officials sitting on California's tax appeal board receive campaign contributions from taxpayers and their representatives with business before the board. The contributions were legal, but Mahoney's research found there was a correlation between surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly enough, contribution levels and successful tax appeals before the board. Accepting for Laura is Rita McWilliams of BNA. I have to admit, I've really been looking particularly forward to this next segment, which I think is something special, and I hope you'll agree. We're now going to spend some time to recognize a pioneering career in broadcast journalism. First of all, I ask you to listen closely to this archival audio, originally aired nearly seven decades ago. Seven decades. This is the work of our honoree, Richard C. Hotelet, reporting for CBS News on the landing on French beaches on D-Day and on the Battle of the Bulge. This is Richard C. Hotelet speaking from London. The Allied forces landed in France early this morning. 
I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of H hour. I was in a ninth Air Force Marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. Below us, the English Channel was a fine, deep blue. There were a few white caps, but we got the impression that it wasn't very rough down below. About five miles off the French coast, we saw a plane in a steep dive laying a smoke screen. Just about the same minute, a pilot said he saw fires on the shore. I looked as hard as I could, and there, down to the left, were some naval vessels. They looked like cruisers, firing broadsides onto the shore. Their guns belched, flame and smoke. We opened our bomb bay doors. Light flak began to come up after us, little balls of fire off to our right and to our left. The bombs and the shells burst together on the target. There were sheets of flame down below, then rolling balls of brown and black smoke. Four and a half thousand feet up, our plane was rocked by the concussion. We got the stench of the explosives. We dropped our bombs as scheduled. And just then we saw, down below on our left, dozens and scores of white streaks as the assault boats raced over the blue water to the beach, leaving their white wakes stretched out behind them. As we turned away from the target, we saw the boats hit the beach. Then we took evasive action I couldn't see any more. Down below, except for some more sporadic flak, it was a dead country. No sign of life. No vehicles on roads, no troop movements. The mission wasn't the way we had figured it. We had expected to see German fortifications give back blow for blow with our ships. There was no sign of it. The circumstances of our flight, the fact that we got there simultaneously with the invading troops and left in a minute, make it impossible to draw any far-reaching conclusions on how the battle is going. But one thing we can say already, and that is that our air supremacy over the coastal invasion zone today is not seriously challenged. It's icy cold on the front tonight, and the mud on the roads and in the fields is frozen hard in wrinkles and folds. The men, digging new positions in the fields, have had to chop at the ground with their shovels and use axes. And over all, over ruined buildings and corpses and the wrecks of tanks and trucks, over everything, this late December chill has thrown a pattern of frost. Out in the forward position, men are lying in holes, beating their hands together, stamping their feet to get warm. And the ones who are in houses and cellars with stoves and something to burn know how lucky they are. It's mainly behind the lines that you realize we're building up for one of the greatest battles to be fought on any front in this world. I return you now to the United States. So a little about his story. In all of journalism, there are few people today representing more inspirational, popular, historical significance than Richard C. Hodelet, the winner of a presidential citation for his distinguished career. As a 23-year-old foreign correspondent for United Press in 1941, Mr. Hodelet was taken prisoner by the Nazis. He was arrested on trumped-up charges of espionage and held in solitary confinement for four months before being released before being released in a prisoner exchange. Now, a little aside for a moment. When we called, when I called him with the help of my friend Mike Friedman over here just a few months ago to talk about some of the mechanics of this evening's event, Wikipedia, thank you, I, I noticed that that particular day just happened to be the anniversary of his release. And I said to him, are you aware today's the 70th anniversary? And I believe what he told me was something along the lines of, I hadn't thought of that. So I guess it all gets better over time. <laughs> Three years later, in 1944, Mr. Hodelet was hired by Edward R. Murrow as the Allied forces were preparing for D-Day. 26 years old, he became a member of the vaunted Murrow Boys of CBS Radio, the group of journalists that helped define broadcast news. And on June 6, 1944, Mr. Hodelet provided American radio audiences with the first eyewitness account of the largest seaborne invasion in history as nearly three million Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. He flew in a bomber that attacked Utah Beach six minutes before H hour. And as you heard, he went on to cover the Battle of the Bulge and other major battles of World War II. At one point, the plane he was in was shot down by enemy fire, and he parachuted to safety. He was among the first American correspondents to enter Berlin at the close of the war and among the first to enter the concentration camps. 
After the war, Mr. Hoddle had opened the CBS News bureaus in Moscow and Bonn. He later served for two decades as the CBS News correspondent at the United Nations. Many of us may remember that. In all, Richard C. Hodelet spent 41 years at CBS News, and he was the last of the original Murrow Boys to retire in 1985. Since then, he has remained active as a writer, commentator, and analyst. The Encyclopedia of Television says his name is synonymous with a style of news analysis that combines a beat reporter's ability to get the story with comprehensive knowledge of whatever events, country, or subject he is covering. In 1999, he returned to CBS Radio, along with former colleagues, including Howard K. Smith, to take part in the network's Millennium Program, the CBS News 20th Century Roundup, produced by Harvey Nagler and Michael Friedman, both of whom are in our audience here this evening, and thank you for that. For the past several years, Mr. Hodelet has served as a visiting fellow at George Washington University, and has guest lectured Professor Friedman's journalism classes every semester since 2001. The students, I'm told, some of whom are here with us tonight, are truly thrilled to have this link to one of the men who actually formed the basis for modern broadcast news. He's also appeared on two recent Kalb Report forums here at the National Press Club, joining our friend Marvin Kalb for a program on war correspondence and another on the life and legacy of Murrow himself. Mr. Hodelet, now 93, who defies that age, is in his eighth decade as a contributor to American journalism. He and his wife, Anne, live in Connecticut. We are honored to have with us this evening his bride, Anne, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, the youngest of which is one-and-a-half-year-old Georgia Hodelet Foley, who's here this evening. Mr. Hodelet, thank you for your inspiring career, and I'll ask you to come up to the stage now and give you your presidential citation as we all offer you a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. I just want to tell you that I tried. Thank you, Mr. Hodelet, and for some reason I feel like your modern contemporaries would have taken more time here at the podium. <laughs> uh, I do have a message to pass along from Casey Murrow, Edward R. Murrow's son, who couldn't be here this evening, and he says, Dear Dick, best wishes and congratulations on the National Press Club Award. I wish I could be there this evening to say that in person. Warmest regards, Casey Murrow. We're going to skip ahead on the program now for a moment, and it's a special honor to recognize two people for their contributions to journalism for their sheer coverage this evening. The National Press Club selected CBS News correspondent Lara Logan and Al Jazeera's Dorothy Parvaz as winners of the John Abishan Press Freedom Award for 2011. The Abishan Press Freedom Award honors those whose actions embody the struggle to advance press freedom and open government. Each year, the club selects one domestic and one international winner each of this award. For 2011, the domestic winner is Lara Logan, the CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and the Correspondent for 60 Minutes. In Egypt earlier this year to cover the uprising against Hosni Mubarak, she was viciously attacked in Tahir Square on the night of February 11. And two months later, she displayed her trademark courage once again in speaking about that on 60 Minutes. She said she talked about it publicly in the hope of breaking the code of silence that often surrounds such attacks. It had the desired effect. 
The Committee to Protect Journalists reported that her interview prompted dozens of other victims to speak out about attacks that occurred in similar mobs or as reprisals for reporting while being held in captivity. Please turn your attentions now to the video screen to see a montage of Lyra's work. My biggest hurdle to getting two stories initially was being a young woman. And that was the hardest thing possible, was overcoming the um, misogyny that governs this business. During the invasion, and I had to phone my, my family and say goodbye, because I knew that there was a, I knew there was a good possibility I wasn't gonna make it to Baghdad. going into those situations of danger? I think really for me it's a constant reminder of how fortunate you are in your daily life. And I believe that this is something that I was meant to do and, uh, and I believe in the importance of doing it and that's why I keep going back. Lara Logan, congratulations. I feel like I'm, I'm outclassed and everything else by Dick. I can't really follow that. Um, Dick, I tried harder. I don't know if that counts. Um, I could sit and listen to you all night. I'm sure everyone in the room felt the same thing. You feel dwarfed by, um, by what you do so well. And, uh, and I think that's what I, I still am trying to live up to that tradition at 60 Minutes and at CBS. And I'm, I'm very unfortunate to be where I am. And, uh, you know, one thing that, I, that I'm not sure I've been able to say enough after what happened to me in Egypt was that you grow up in this business, and let's face it, it's, uh, as a number of people have said to me tonight, it's brutal. And you sort of, you know, you have, to, you have to get used to that as normal. You expect to be screwed by everybody around you, right? Because sooner or later that's going to happen. So you, you just protect yourself against that by keeping your head down and working as hard as you possibly can and hoping that somehow you're still going to surface at the end. But um, in the wake of, of Egypt, I, um, I guess I, I kind of discovered something that I'd really forgotten and maybe overlooked and maybe um, underestimated. And that was um, when all my colleagues came out and did and said the things that they did. Um, one of the first things that happened to me was I got a box um, from someone called Ann Coulter at ABC News. And I didn't know who Ann was and I'd never met her. But then suddenly in my lap was this beautiful white box and it was filled with letters from all the uh, women who worked at ABC. And I sub subsequently received two um, packages like that. And um, you know, suddenly uh, it was like being a newborn baby, you feel that kind of vulnerable. And everything that my colleagues came out and said about what happened to me personally, privately, publicly, all of that was just like wrapping me in a blanket and I could start to rebuild and find that person that was, I guess, lying in Tarrier Square somewhere. And um, I'm so grateful for that in so many ways. And I have, I have such respect for the people that I work with because I think every true journalist in their heart is exactly the same. We're all doing it for the same reason. Every person that stood up here, my mother died of MRSA. Thank you very much to you for your work. My sister actually does work in Mozambique and South Africa on HIV prevention. She's one of the people that does that. So, but all of us at our heart, we do it because we really truly believe in it. That's the journalism that survives. That's the journalism that, um, that you did, Dick, so much better than me. <laughs> if I could be as good as you, that would be an achievement. That would be my personal achievement. Um, and I, I really wanted to say thank you to the National Press Club um, you took me in your arms, thank you, and recognized what I've tried to do, and um, and hopefully, you know, I can, 
I can go far beyond Egypt and leave a greater contribution than that in the work that I do. But um, it means the world to me, and uh, and it, it helped me um, rebuild. And I am very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lara, and it, just a special, you know, it's so special to have this line of continuity from Mr. Hodelet to you and our, our next winner as well. One of the most important missions of the club and any NPC president is to speak actively, to issue statements, as we did today, when needed on press freedom issues, today's problem in Iran. And the case of our next winner was one that kept us busy earlier this year. As with Lara, we're very happy that she could join us here this evening. The international winner is Al Jazeera's Dorothy Parvaz. She also faced terrifying treatment while doing her job, and her story also unfolded amid the Mideast turmoil that was arguably this year's signature global news event so far. She was detained on April 29th while arriving in Syria and placed in a jail where she heard the sounds of savage beatings before being sent to Iran. Altogether, she spent 19 days in detention and out of touch with her family and colleagues. Here's Dorothy's story. men being beaten to within an inch of their lives, uh, crying out, um, being locked up in cell blocks. I was handcuffed repeatedly, uh, blindfolded, taken to a courtyard, left to hear these men being beaten. They all sounded very young. They sounded to be in their late teens, early 20s. So it was uh, an overall uh, a terrifying experience. They uh, took me to an, the airport in Damascus, where three men forced me onto an airplane bound for Iran, where I was kept for two weeks, roughly. My thoughts, though, were, aside from being with my family and worrying about whether or not they knew where I was, were with the people in Syria and the, and the younger people I saw there. I couldn't understand the reason, not just why the men were being beaten, but there were young women. I talked to young women who had been clearly just swept up, blindfolded, and taken to these places and not being told why. They had no contact with their families either. I felt I was away from all eyes of the law. I can't describe just this dark place that I was in. It was this disused military compound, it seemed, um, away from everything. At a certain point, you want to cover your ears. You don't want to hear it anymore because it becomes that much. I mean, it seemed endless. Mid-morning to late into night, at random times, you would hear just beatings and screams and cries. And you want to cover your ears. But someone should hear these people. Someone should understand what they're going through. Dorothy, congratulations. Anything else, uh, Mr. Hartlett? You succeeded. Um, that should be clear. Uh, thank you so much for this honor and this privilege. I accept this not just on my behalf, but on behalf of my colleagues at Al Jazeera. We've had a heck of a time covering this Arab Spring. I can tell you that much. And to the young journalists starting out, um, if anybody tries to tell you that the press doesn't have any power, there's nothing quite like being interrogated for a few weeks about your work to make you realize that you strike fear into the heart of tyrants and that um, that is power. So I just want to say thank you again.
Thank you, Dorothy. Like Richard C. Hodelet, both of these journalists embody a special courage so necessary in telling the difficult and dangerous stories of their time around the world. Congratulations to both of you. And it's also worth remembering that according to Reporters Without Borders, 35 journalists have been killed, nearly 150 journalists in prison this year alone in the course of doing their job. And our thoughts and prayers are with them, their families, and their colleagues. We'll now move on to our other award categories. The Ann Cottrell Free Animal Reporting Award is named in memory of Ann Cottrell Free, a National Press Club member who wrote extensively about animals and their welfare. The print online winner is Michael M. Phillips of the Wall Street Journal, who told the story of Gunner, a bomb-sniffing yellow lab who couldn't handle the stress of combat in Afghanistan. With his story, Phillips draws attention to the trauma that many dogs undergo when assigned to the front lines in war. His compelling narrative shows that, just like humans, dogs can suffer from severe post-traumatic stress disorder. After Phillips' story appeared, scores of readers asked how they could adopt him. Phillips forwarded the offers to the Marine Corps, who then chose a couple whose son was killed in Iraq. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you uh, very much. I, I would, I guess, um, have one bit of advice for the young journalists who are out there today. Uh, if for some reason you miss D-Day, <laughs> if you overlook the corruption in, uh, say, the Seattle ferry system, <laughs> if you don't strike fear into the hearts of tyrants, you can't miss with a dog story. <laughs> Thank you. And the winner for best acceptance speeches goes to. <laughs> the broadcast winner was Brad Woodard, who won for a body of work that made a difference for animals. In 2010, Woodard filed stories on the effects of the BP oil spill on wildlife in Louisiana and on the deplorable conditions uncovered at an egg factory in Texas, which is one of the largest in the nation, and also on deplorable conditions at a puppy mill. Here's an example of Brad's work. Oil continues to encroach upon the Louisiana coastline and increasingly wildlife is being affected, especially susceptible to the brown pelican just removed from the federal endangered species list within the last six months. When it comes to the victims of the spill in the Gulf, and there are plenty to go around, the plight of its voiceless victims is especially compelling. Innocent, confused, and oblivious to the human dependence on oil that landed them here. They are brought to this wildlife rehabilitation center in increasing numbers each day. Distressed, but too fatigued to resist the good intentions of volunteers from around the country. Congratulations, Brad. from the, the Murrow boy to the pet detective. Uh, they run the gamut here. Uh, I, I say that in jest because I, I take animal welfare issues very seriously because uh, it's something that resonates with everyone. Uh, they are what we are not. They're genuine and um, they are who they are. And um, I'm firmly convinced that uh, there's a lot they could teach us, you know. Um, the importance of uh, living in the moment, not in the past, not in the future and appreciating what you have and not obsessing about that which you do not. And uh, that, that's pretty powerful. Uh, on a broader note, I'd like to say these are strange times for journalists, both print and broadcast, because people are so ideologically blinded that they perceive uh, objectivity as bias, simply because it doesn't reflect their point of view on the world. And uh, that troubles me deeply. And. Uh, don't know what I'm trying to say there, but it's just a statement of fact, and you all know it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Joanne Booz, you know way too much about me. All right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next award is the Joan M. Friedenberg Online Journalism Award, award recognizing the most significant contributions in journalism by online media. 
It is named in memory of the founding editor of Online News Hour and the wife of our former NPC president, Jonathan Salant. Jonathan is here with us this evening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. The co-winners are MSNBC.com and the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting for outstanding multimedia reporting in Haiti to tell the story of the January 2010 earthquake. MSNBC.com reporters and producers focused on Haiti's amputees, telling the story through the eyes of a young boy who lost, lost his left leg when his house collapsed and then learned to walk with the prosthesis. The boy was among 4,000 Haitians who lost limbs in the earthquake. Congratulations to MSNBC. Let's see briefly now how they posted this poignant yet hopeful story on their website with a slideshow. Accepting the award from SNBC is Jonelle Alicia. Uh, thanks very much. It's quite an honor, certainly an honor to be in such distinguished company. Um, um, we had a great team over there and told a really compelling story. Our little guy was four then, he's five now, and on July 20th he received uh, yet another prosthesis, and so we are um, very happy to be committed to telling his story the whole way through, despite our competing priorities, to, to stay with this, um, because once we leave, the folks that we report about are still there. So, thank you very much. The Pulitzer Center created partnerships with YouTube to produce a year-long series of compelling multimedia projects on recovery efforts in remote parts of Haiti, including women, vulnerable women in tent camps, and we do offer our congratulations to the Pulitzer Center. Here is their enterprising report on the untold efforts of one woman bringing education to the children in a tent city. I am a teacher but mostly a musician, really. Our first concern after the earthquake was to provide some frame for these kids that had gone through such a trauma. Also with us this evening is Natalie Applewhite with the Pulitzer Center. Thank you. It's an honor to be here um, accepting this award on behalf of the Pulitzer Center. Um, and it's a great honor to be recognized by the National Press Club and certainly to be recognized amongst such an outstanding group of other journalists here this evening. This has been one of our most important projects this year and a true labor of love for us throughout the year. Um, our mission at the center is to raise awareness of systemic issues that too often go underreported in the mainstream news media. Um, our intention with the work here that we've done in Haiti has really been to, to provide sustained attention to this issue and the various and ongoing challenges that remain after the news media and the public's attention have moved on. Uh, the work that the online gateway that we produced here that's being recognized draws on five different reporting projects conducted over the course of the last year and it's taken many different shapes. Um, the, the, work was featured as video poems that incorporated uh, interviews from characters on the ground in Haiti and uh, was featured in NewsHour, YouTube, it was a three-part series in USA Today um, and was featured in a variety of other news outlets. Its most recent embodiment was a multimedia performance at the National Black Theater Festival where we took the video poems and produced them 
um, to uh, put with a backdrop set to music in front of a live audience. The goal of all of this was to present work that would capture the humanity of the Haitians that have been going through all of the experiences and to try to go beyond the images of rubble and statistics about deaths. And um, anyway, none of this would have been possible without the amazing group of journalists that we worked with along the way. And a lot of credit definitely goes to our web developer who's also here this evening and who should stand up, Dan McCary, who developed the website. <laughs> And Anne Mora Youngman, who is also back there, who should also stand up, who is, who is Mara, stand up, um, who has helped maintain the website along the way. Um, and a huge thanks to all of our staff, because this has really been a very important collaborative project that has involved every single person who has been part of the center. Um, and absolutely to John Sawyer, our executive director, who has led the work of all of the projects that we've done and really created the vision for the center in the first place. So, and finally, to the people of Haiti who so graciously opened their homes and hearts to our reporters in the first place and made this work possible. So, thank you. The Sandy Hume Memorial Award for Excellence in Political Journalism honors excellence and objectivity in political coverage by reporters under 35 years old. It was named in memory of the late Sandy Hume, a young reporter for The Hill, who broke the story of a revolt of sorts against then House Speaker Newt Gingrich. The winner is Joshua Coors of The Nation for his report, Disposable Soldiers, about the military's treatment of wounded soldiers, the reporting was well documented with gripping details that really made the story come alive. It also clearly had an impact on the political debate since Coors was called to testify before Congress. Here's a brief clip of that testimony. Those shrapnel wounds were caused by personality disorder. Uh, sa sailor Samantha Spitz, uh, her pelvis and two bones in her ankle were fractured. They said that her fractured pelvis was caused by personality disorder. And uh, in a case that, that really touched me, I think of specialist Bonnie Moore, she developed an inflamed uterus during service. Uh, they said her profuse vaginal bleeding was caused by personality disorder. Uh, civilian doctors thought it was something a little more severe. Uh, she went to a hospital uh, in Germany where they removed her uterus and appendix, but after being given that personality disorder discharge and denied all benefits, she and her teenage daughter became homeless. Joshua. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, this story was the story of how the U.S. Army tortured an American soldier. Uh, Sergeant Chuck Luther, he was stuck in a closet and held there for over a month with armed guards uh, enforcing uh, sleep deprivation, uh, blasting heavy metal music at him all through the night, uh, keeping the lights on. He tried to escape the closet at one point. They pinned him down, injected him with sleeping medication, dragged him back to the closet, uh, all in an effort mm -hmm. to get him to sign fraudulent documents saying that he was wounded before coming to Iraq and thus not eligible for disability and medical benefits. Uh, his case is not an isolated incident. Since 2001, 25,600 soldiers have been pressed into signing these phony documents. It's saving the military about $14.2 billion in disability and medical care. And, um, uh, you know, it's been a real honor for me to cover these soldiers' stories, and uh, I want to dedicate this award to those thousands of soldiers and to the journalists who are intent on telling their stories. Thank you.
We next have two honorable mentions, and I'll ask one to come up before the other in this category. Honorable mentions for this award go to Matt Canham of the Salt Lake Tribune. He's a member of the National Press Club and a former winner of a Press Club Award for a series of stories on Blue Dog Democrats. Matt? The other winner is Alex Burns of Politico for a series of stories on off offbeat election candidates. Congratulations. The next area of journalism being recognized is the Joseph D. Ryle Award for Excellence in Writing on the Problems of Geriatrics. The award is named in honor of Ryle, a longtime National Press Club member who left an endowment for this award, as many of our awards were so endowed. The winner is Inside Edition for its excellent and alarming report on insurance salesmen pressuring and persuading people on Medicare to buy annuities they did not need. The victims called in search of Medigap coverage, but they got a pitch instead to buy investments that were totally unsuitable. This was a first-rate investigation of potential financial threat to millions of people on Medicare, Here's a sample of what their cameras captured. You gotta put them in the nursing home. You need to treat these people like you're talking to a child. These men are teaching new insurance okay. salespeople no, the tricks of the trade. But what they don't know is this Inside Edition producer is in the classroom with a hidden camera. I'm serious. You're laughing. Make her almost cry. They're training these people for their new jobs as agents for Bankers Life and Casualty, a giant 100-year-old insurance company based in Chicago. Every day, the company and its agents reach out to thousands of senior citizens across the country. I was following up in regards to the Medicare. Accepting this award is Bob Reed. Bob, do you have some news to tell us? <laughs> you want to get another picture? Here? Bob is much better looking. Um, excuse me, I've become a cliche. I actually jotted things down on a cocktail napkin. And nothing is as pithy as uh, I tried. Um, first of all, thank you very much to the National Press Club for recognizing our work. Um, this is such a great honor on behalf of my co-producer, Charlie McElravey, our senior producer, Bob Reed, um, Philip Capsa, who is actually behind the camera tonight, as well as our investigative correspondent, Matt Mahar, who could not be here this evening. He is the lifeblood of our unit. He shaped what our unit became. And this was actually his last story before leaving Inside Edition last year. So this honor is even more sweet this evening. So again, thank you very much. Um, you know, we're, we're, a, we're kind of a, a unique show. We do stories on Snooky. So when we are doing, uh, we have an investigative unit that's 22 years strong, and we are fiercely, fiercely dedicated to doing investigative stories on behalf of people who do not have a voice. And many times we end up doing these stories on the elderly. And the fact that we were able to give six minutes of airtime, which is a lifetime for television, to this issue, we need to thank our bosses for that. It doesn't happen often. Um, you know, the story was done uh, over a year ago. Today, we still hear from people every single day, um, uh, kids of, of, of uh, elderly people who may have bought an annuity um, and, you know, this was unsuitable, this might have been suspicious. They have then, in turn, called up an attorney general, um, a lawyer. Um, there are active attorney general investigations going on today into bankers' life and casualty, as well as a Senate investigation. So people watched, and they learned, and they acted. So for us as investigative journalists, that is the most fulfilling thing that we could possibly stand up here and, and brag about. Um, but this comes awfully close. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.
An honorable mention in this category goes to Walter Roach, Jr. of the Pittsburgh Tribune Review for persistent investigation to find out about widespread mistreatment of patients in state-run homes for veterans in Pennsylvania. Accepting the award for the Tribune Review is Mark Grutza. On a lighter note, we take a look at the best of humor writing. The Angel Graha Humor Award is named in memory of a National Press Club member who authored two humorous nonfiction books. The winner is Al Kamen of the Washington Post for his In the Loop column. As the judges said, being funny once a week is hard. Being funny every day is even harder. Cayman's work with In the Loop is consistently humorous while delivering a serving of news on a daily basis. Cayman has been at the Post for three decades. He covered various hard news beats before settling into writing a column with his unique blend of humor and news. Congratulations, Al. can't be funny after all the stuff that's happened here. I want to thank the National Press Club. I want to thank uh, my lovely wife of 30 years, uh, who most people know as the long-suffering Laurel Kamen. Um, I, I want to say that I, I didn't think the Post should enter my column as a uh, humor column because I know some people find it funny. <laughs> but the people I write about are the ones who call me in the morning not great senses of humor. <laughs> but anyway, thanks to the club. I appreciate it much. Thank you very much. Honorable mention went to Lore Schoberg, who writes the alt text column for Wired.com. It leverages the tech revolution for laughs. The next award is the Michael A. Dornheim Award, which recognizes writing about aerospace, defense, the airline industry, or aerospace science and engineering. The award is presented in celebration of the career of the late Michael A. Dornheim, a longtime reporter and editor of Aviation Week and Spe Space Technology magazine. I'm told that his mother, Charlene, and brother, Daniel, are here with us tonight. Let's give them a round of applause of appreciation. <laughs> The winner is Christopher J. Costelli of Inside the Pentagon, a member of the National Press Club, for his reporting on an important breach of safety in the defense industry. Costelli's reporting in the newsletter Inside the Pentagon revealed that the U.S. Defense Department had failed to install cockpit voice recorders in its fleet of V-22 Osprey aircraft more than a decade after Congress passed a law directing that such devices be installed in all of them. His scoop caught the attention of the House Armed Services Committee amazingly enough, which launched an inquiry. <laughs> Ultimately, the Marine Corps, which flies most of the V-22s, agreed to include millions in its budget to pay for the installation of voice recorders in the aircraft's cockpit. Congratulations, Chris. Thank you to the National Press Club, the judges, and the family of Michael Dornheim. It's a tremendous honor to receive this award and to be associated with Mike's highly acclaimed work. I unfortunately never had the pleasure of getting to know Mike, but I've truly enjoyed sitting with and meeting his wonderful family this evening. The tribute to Mike on Avweek's website notes that his reporting likely helped save lives and that he wrote about virtually every major air safety issue of the past two decades. It's with that same spirit that I investigated and reported on the lack of cockpit voice recorders in the military's V-22 Ospreys. I was surprised to learn last fall that the Pentagon had apparently failed to implement the decade-old requirement. Uh, I had reported on the program for some time, so I remembered the requirement. And last fall, the V-22 program officials resisted answering my questions uh, for weeks. No one wanted to talk about how the Pentagon had violated the spirit of the law, if not the letter. Sure, they had put the requirements on the books, but where was the money to implement it? 
No one wanted to talk about how the Marine Corps had no plan to buy or field the devices. Uh, but uh, I refused to be ignored. I confirmed the requirement had been disregarded, and uh, I interviewed the investigator of last April's fatal crash in, uh, in Afghanistan, and he told me that such a device could have helped determine the cause of that disaster. Uh, the the uh, impact was extremely gratifying, of course, to see the Marine Corps and the military uh, turn around on that. Um, so uh, as Mike Dorheim uh, well knew, we reporters have a great responsibility to relentlessly ask tough questions, especially when lives are at stake, to uncover inconvenient truths, and to hold accountable massive bureaucracies such as the Pentagon. We must be muckrakers, not for the sake of being difficult, but to protect the public interest. I welcome that challenge anew with every working day. Thank you. Next, the Lee Walzak Award for Political Analysis. This award is named in memory of the late Lee Walzak, a Washington editor, bureau chief, and White House correspondent who worked for Bloomberg News and Business Week. It is designed to recognize excellence in political analysis, and with us tonight is his wife, Maria. Maria, thank you very much. The winner of the Lee Walzak Award is Dan Balls of the Washington Post. In his thoughtful pieces, Dan manages to be analytical and cutting edge, or as one judge put it, he is excellent at setting the conventional wisdom before it becomes conventional wisdom. This veteran political reporter analyzes the 2010 election results in a way that is prescient, the disaffected independents, the humble but not cowed president, the supremely confident House Republicans, all still very much relevant in today's political climate. He portrayed how former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was problematic for the president, all while giving a keen historical perspective on the Republicans' blueprint for change in the fall of 2010. Dan Balls, congratulations. This has been a remarkable evening, um, a reminder of everything that is good about journalism, um, the courage that people bring to this every day, um, the dedication that people have to it, um, the difficult times we're going through, and the individual acts of excellence that are committed every day on behalf of um, readers and viewers all around the country and around the world, and um, I'm honored to be part of this. Um, I can be neither as brief nor as eloquent as Mr. Hodlett. Um, I want to thank the Press Club for this very much. Um, Maria, thank you. Um, I, I, I really want to accept this um, on behalf of all my colleagues and friends at the Post. Um, it's great to be honored at the same time as Al and Paul. Kamen and I have sat next to one another for longer than we are prepared to admit. Um, and have egged each other on in, in what we do, and so it's a, it's a special treat to be here tonight being honored along with Al. Um, but um, my colleagues at the Post uh, know that, that when every, anybody wins an award, it's because of the work that we all do together. Um, David Broder, who, as Mark said, was a mentor of mine and many others at the Post, instilled, I think, in all of us um, uh, a sense of both excellence and collegiality that I think is, we like to think is rare. Um, it has made the Post a special place to do any kind of journalism and particularly political journalism. Um, political journalism is, um, is challenging in ways that are difficult to describe, but political analysis, um, you can be wrong more often than you're right. Um, I thank Kevin Merida for finding a few pieces in which I may have looked like I knew what I was talking about uh, and not the ones where if you look back you would say he had no idea what was going on <laughs> because so often that is the case in political journalism. We are, we are trying to figure out where the country is moving uh, and when things are moving as quickly as they are um, it's, hard to, it's sometimes hard to see that until after the fact when we all become wise with 2020 hindsight. 
Um, so in that spirit, I really want to say thank you to all my friends and colleagues at the Post for all you've done for me to help make things better. Um, Mike and Robin, it's great to have you here. Uh, we were all together for that wonderful um, commemoration of Dave's life a few months ago, and uh, he lives on here at the Press Club and with all of us who, who do what we do. Um, finally, thank you to my wife, Nancy Baltz. Um, we've been together 42 years. And um, I, couldn't, I could not do what I do without her love and support. So thank you. And thanks to all of you. Thank you, Dan. And thank you to Mr. Jones from the Post for being here this evening as well. Well, this concludes the National Press Club's 2011 awards dinner, but some people deserve our thanks. We want to recognize the excellent work of our judges who are listed in tonight's program, and I invite you to take a look at that. In fact, would any of the judges in the audience here this evening who are in attendance please stand up, and we'd like to give you a big hand and a big thanks. I also owe a big debt of gratitude to Will Lester, this year's new chairman of the NPC Awards Committee. He's done a fantastic job. He's apologized a thousand times to me this year, and he had absolutely no reason to do it once. He did a fantastic job. Also, John Donnelly of our Press Freedom Committee. John, my colleague on the National Press Club board. And Andrea Snyder of Bloomberg, who you saw earlier with our scholarship committee, as well as Mike Sorhan, our board liaison for awards. In addition, I owe a great deal to the very humble Joanne Booz of the National Press Club staff, who puts in so many hours organizing the entries. I call her the boss because she gets things done so very well here at the club. Also thanks to the staff of the NPC Broadcast Operations Center, led by Via Udnans, and our Executive Director, Bill McCarran. <laughs> Finally, thanks to all of you who entered this year's National Press Club Awards competition. Your wor work is a great reminder that journalism, very well done, is not in short supply. So we thank you for your many contributions. And to all of our winners, on behalf of the National Press Club, which has stood here for more than 100 years, congratulations. We hope to see you on October 28th during our Fourth Estate Awards Dinner for Jim Lehrer. So until then, good night and thank you. Thank you.